Sex Present Story Family Salute. Y'all, it's your boy Tim Snowback here with another one. We got a good one tonight. We hope you enjoy it. This is a fellow YouTuber here. She just started a new channel. And it's it's being successful. It's working. So we're proud of her for that. We hope that you'll go follow her if you enjoy the content. I did put her channel link in the description. So you can look at the description of this video and tap that. It's Corrections Mama 23, I believe is the name of it. And I called her a prison guard earlier and she got on my butt about that. She said, I'm a correctional officer. It's more respectful. So that's what I'm going to call it, right? And uh, her son is AZ Ruxin. They do the New Age Plug, the podcast, the YouTube Streets podcast, and they do, he has a channel. Man, they do so much content. But shout out to AZ Ruxin. And I'm, I think you're going to enjoy this one, right? So I'm going to bring her in. And I'll let her tell you about her channel and how you can follow her and all that good stuff. Then we'll get started. Miss Donna, good evening. Tell them about your channel real quick and how they can find you. Um, it's Corrections Mama 27 channel. 27. I'm sorry. I said 23. It's 27. And um, that's about roughly how many years I was a corrections officer. And um. I started out, uh, my son interviewed me on his channel and then a lot of his viewers wanted me to start a channel and that's the name that they um, voted and wanted me to have. So that's what we went with. Cool, cool. So you see it on the screen at the bottom and I apologize for saying it wrong. It's Corrections Mama 27, all one word. You can type it in separately because I tried both ways and it works. And I think 20, 24 is my email. And then 27 is the. Okay. That might be what yeah. got confused. But so I found you through your son and their podcast, right? And I asked you for this interview. It's kind of rare that I ask anybody for an interview, but I like your style. You're well spoken and you have experience being a correctional officer in two states. So that's kind of different, right? I've never. I've met so many correctional officers from Texas, so many COs, but I've never met one from another place, the federal system and all that, where you could actually compare both places, right? Where you know, you know, so when you, I'm sure they both have their strengths and they both have their weaknesses and you're the one that gets to know it the most because you've experienced them both. But is yeah. it correct that you were an officer in Texas first? Yes, I was um, in the late 90s for about four years and I was in Texas because <clears throat> that's where I started my career. And uh, we were at Fort Hood because my husband at the time was in the military. And, um, you know, John was just a little squirt and uh, we, we moved there and I couldn't find a job anywhere because Colleen and Copper's Cove is pretty much just bars and there's not a lot of opportunity there. And if you get a job on post, they want you, it's a four year waiting list. Well, the tour is only four years, so you're never going to get in, you know? So um, my, my neighbor introduced, she was working there. She was retired military and her husband was active and she talked me into it, but I used to go talk to her and have coffee with her and she would tell me all her stories and I was just really fascinated and interested in what she did and very curious because, you know, it's kind of uh, closed off to the public. And um, she encouraged me to get a job in there. And I just laughed. I said, no way. There's no way I could do that. I'm just, I'm too soft. I'm too like, kind of, I'm kind of shy and I'm very naive and they would probably eat me alive. But she talked me into it. And I did it, and I decided before I did it, I kind of had an uh, idea of what I wanted to get out of it. I felt like I got taken advantage a lot of a lot, and because I was naive, because I believed things that people told me, I was easy to, you know, hoodwink. And um, I wanted to become a stronger person and I wanted to be more aware of people's intentions and I wanted to be less naive and I really wanted to just come out a much stronger person and it definitely did that. 
because it did or swim you know what i mean like if yeah. you're but you have to go into it knowing yourself like i already knew my weaknesses and i didn't want those weaknesses to get me compromised or get me into trouble you know what i mean so i if you're aware of that you know going into it then i think you're likely to become stronger and i had certain expectations and i knew it was going to be difficult i knew it was going to be hard my family was against it my husband was against it um he got more and more against it the more and more the longer i worked there but i think it was because i was wise enough to his games and his lies he didn't like that oh, so. Bet. so that's one <laughs> thing about it right you're in there with all them criminals and crooks they run you you'll learn how to spot game from a million miles away won't you yeah yeah so i so i yeah. learned how to find before i think i had blinders on like i just did not want to see that side of people and um it made me i i really felt like it made me very vulnerable so it probably did so it might have been a good thing for you you said something yeah. that i've said before that a lot of these prisons in texas especially are located in rural areas where a lot of people don't have others you know other places to work they need those jobs stuff like that so it hey i if you need a quick job and you live near a prison there's nothing wrong with it i guess you know we'll, you can decide that after we talk but you I want to talk about what you said about your 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 weakness and your naiveness, but in a minute, okay, I'm I'm going to definitely remember that and come back to that because that's something that prisoners particularly will look for, prey upon, and try to identify. You know what I mean? So I'm sure they did. I'm I'm pretty sure you knew what to do or, or learned what to do. But I wanted to ask you. So in Texas, the hiring process we see everywhere, right? On every single prison bus, there's like a 1-800 number to call. There's a website. It always says hiring employees and everything like this. Like, did you call that number and how hard was it to actually get hired on? I don't, I think I just followed the procedure that my, my neighbor told me to do. And she used, and she had me use her as a reference. Cause obviously we just moved there. I didn't know anybody there. And, um, she told me, you know, because I told her what my concerns were about doing that. And she was like, but you have a strong character. I can see that. You're not somebody who's just going to go out and do something stupid and break the law. You have a strong character. And so it's only going to make you a stronger person. It's, it's as long as you're aware of what your weaknesses are and you make sure that, you know, it's up to you. I mean, but she didn't think I would have a problem with it. And she said, you know, we need good people working in the prison because there is, is corruption. And we do need good people that aren't corrupt to keep a balance in the prison. Yes, ma'am. It's very, it's very important because it's so prison is a struggle between good and evil. That's how I look at it. And no matter where you feel this good or evil comes from, it's real. And it's, it's human nature, right? Some people are good, some people are evil. And that goes for staff, inmates, medical workers, hell, the mailman bringing you the mail. You know what I mean? It's just human nature. So, yes, they definitely have to have some type of good people in there, you know. And unfortunately, a lot of times in Texas, the good people don't progress. They don't get the promotions. They don't get the jobs they want, you know, and that's part of the system, too. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But so I asked you before we got on here about the boot camp, right? And you said, it wasn't as tough as in Arizona, and we'll definitely say that for sure. But what what was it like? Like when were you expecting that? I mean, you're saying uh, you're just looking for a job and stuff. What did they do? Like, I was just looking for a job. I really didn't know what the expectations were. I didn't really have any expectations, really. On um, I knew that it was a process. It takes a long time because they do a very thorough background. They do a psych evaluation. They make you take at least two psych evaluation tests. They've got lie scales and stuff in them. Um, I took those tests before through a psychologist when I was going to court for custody with my ex. So I already was familiar with those tests. And basically you just answer as quick as you can, try to be honest. Um, and they're going to ask you the same question different times, the same different ways several times. But they make you do a physical. They just want to make sure that you're not going to, you know, 
have a heart attack and die. But they hired some people that were um, super, super heavy. I know I've no, so listen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how come half the COs that I've seen look like they're about to have a heart attack and die at any moment? What's going on? Well, I think part of it is, well, obviously lifestyle and stuff. A lot of people in America are fat because we eat a lot of fast food and a lot of junk. And also, um, it's a very stressful job. And so you get that cortisol rush. I was overweight towards the end of my career, too. I was I was pretty hefty towards the end of my career. But, uh, you know, I think it's the cortisol and, and plus um, the adrenaline and that stuff when you've got uh, emergencies and things happening and inmates fighting or stabbing each other. That's a lot of hormones and things running through your body. And then two, some people eat as a comfort. Some people eat, eat when right. they're bored, you know? So, so, so listen, and, uh, I think stress to, has a lot to do with it. And it could be someone who's just lazy and unhealthy. From the inmate side, we used to blame it on the ODR and the free cakes and everything all day. Because we would see, do you, do you remember the ODR, the officer's dining room? Yes, but I never... I never ate in the ODR, but one time, and I went in that in there and I cracked my own egg and made my own food. Um, I never ate at the prisons ever. I didn't even drink the, uh, use their ice or anything like that, just because I didn't trust it. First of all, the food is not good. Texas is actually better than Arizona because they have their own farms. They have their real eggs and stuff like that. In Arizona, they don't. You just get oh, wow. total crap. You don't get real food in Arizona. That's, but that's got to be horrible if it's worse than Texas. They don't even have real eggs. Um, it's The food there is terrible. Everything's instant. There's And there's it, almost, there's rarely any meat. Every now and, and then. I hate, I hate to get off topic so yeah. far from what I had planned, but do you remember the prison eggs? They probably have the green ones where they're really green and they cook them and serve them like that, scrambled eggs. You ever seen that? No, in, in Texas. Oh yeah, no. lots of times you go in there in the morning and they scoop you some scrambled eggs on your plate and they were green and I never knew why. It's probably you. something they were putting in it. I didn't use. I worked as a floor officer in Texas. Um, I never worked in the kitchen or had any like. I really wanted to do the high rider job, but um, oh, wow, I didn't really? have enough experience to do that. And they, I don't know. You probably. You probably got to, you know, suck some dick to get that job, I guess. <laughs> probably do. Listen, corrections, mama going to be hot riding on the horse with the shotgun. Oh, man, I can see it now. <laughs> well, I do so have proud horses of here. I do ride. Um, but I think you have to have quite a bit of time in. And I just knew I wasn't going to be there long enough to do that. So I, I never got that job. So, so look, when you, never really put in when, you when, when you go through the boot camp, be honest, like, so you said they hire some heavy people. Is, is it really challenging? Like, is it like on the Marines we see on TV? What are they What are they doing to train you to get you ready for this yeah. combat zone you're going in? Some states do have, like, a boot camp. Like, Arizona had a for real boot camp that was really difficult. It was physical agility and all that stuff. And then class during the day. And they would try to uh, yell at you and act like you're a soldier and talk shit to you and stuff. I used to just roll my eyes. I was like, this is a joke. But um, in Texas, we didn't have the agility boot camp at all. We went to like a place they rented and it was like a college class. And we took a college class on rules, learned how to do journals and log books. Um, we practiced to use the radio like fake ones. We um we went to the range, and I don't know what they carry now, but they um, they carried revolvers when I was there. Did they so, teach you what a code twenty is on the radio? You yeah, we that? had to we had to learn the ten codes, and um, we had to reenact stuff. They prepare you for stuff that you see and reenact stuff. They make you drag each other, and they do some like stuff to make sure that you know you need to drag it a body out of a, a building you can one thing that i thought was interesting too in texas is if there is we didn't have ics's then i think they were called code threes and when they had a code 
you get locked in the dorm. They don't let you out. Right. If there's a riot or something going on, you don't get to get you don't get to say, hey, push the button. Let me out of here. No, uh -huh. you got to stay in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know if they've changed that policy. Uh -uh. They ain't changed it. It's still the same. It's, dang it's a dangerous job. That's what I'm, I tell people. I, so on this channel, we never. You know, they tell us get out. Get listen, out. On, on, on my channel, I never, ever hate on the officers, right? Because I've seen some really cool, good officers. I've seen some really bad ones. And there's still good ones right now working there that leak stuff out that needs to be seen. And like that. So there's a battle behind the lines of TDCJ with some of the good officers trying to fight the fight, but they get stepped on so hard by the administration, you know, and punished. Mm -hmm. So they have to be secretive. So we're never hard on them. We realize, and uh, you're saying that, you know, saying, Hey, she's admitting she's coming in. She's a nice, sweet person, maybe a little naive. And she's now in an environment where they're going to lock her in during a riot. She ain't got nothing to do with, you know? So this, this is the only job other than being a police officer where you probably don't know what you're signing up for all the way because anything can happen. Right. I mean, you, yeah. you have to really sign up willing and knowingly that anything can happen. So that's pretty different. And I think a lot of people would have trouble relating to that. Right. Cause yeah. I drive trucks. I know every day what my day is going to be. Unless I have some kind of unforeseen accident. Every day is the same. I know what's going to happen. Most people's jobs are like that. So when you're coming in, especially, Y'all, they'll rotate you on buildings and different places and you're seeing different faces and things like that all day. And you're dealing with a lot of inmates. So it's a lot of personalities. So like I say, we don't we don't do no hating on here. What we will do is expose the bad ones. We will say when they're doing crazy stuff, things like that, when we get that information, because that is the good fight, too. You know what I mean? So so I just wanted you to know that like we're, we're definitely not here against you and should be nobody in this chat either because we're all pretty much thinking like you know what i mean but so when you I, and by the way i was messing with you because code 20 that's what they yelled when the inmate was masturbating that was the um, one on the right that was the i one don't on remember the, that was like 30 20 i know 30 years ago almost i don't remember we just, all that listen time. we just but heard that on the man's radio a code three was you needed a responder but now that's changed because it's changed across the whole United States. Everybody uses the incident command system now. Okay, I'm sure they do too, because that's a federal thing. When the 9-11 towers happened and there was communication problems between the police and the fire department and all that, they passed a law and said that needs to stop. Everybody, every state no. agency and federal agency need to learn how to talk to each other. And we all need to handle everything the same way. So they streamlined it and said all state and federal agencies have to use, you know, the incident command system. And it has That's different tiers and different levels. For good different idea. Levels I, I can understand period. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So look, uh, next thing question I had, I just want to ask you these few questions and we can just kind of freestyle the rest. So when you're in this boot camp, you're still exactly not really knowing what to expect, but they're trying to get you ready. Do y'all get to pick where you're going to go? Like what your assignment is? Is it going to be near your house? Do they do a lottery? How does that work on where you end up? Um, I think they just kind of put you where they need you. You can tell them the area you need to work because you're not going to want to drive. I'm not going to drive to Houston, you know, when I live in <laughs> Fort Hood. So um, they let you stay in the area you want. And, but you know, there's so many prisons in Texas. It's a prison state. It's a big state. There's, they put a lot of people away, but uh, they just put you where they need you. And they put me in a female unit. I know now probably because you need more female officers on a female unit to do the female jobs that men can't do. Men can't st strip search an inmate. They can't pat them down. Um, I didn't know that. I always, I always wondered about that. Mm -hmm. they, some of them don't even want to do a security watch because these chicks will flash them and stuff. and Or they'll lie and say, oh, he did this or he did that when he didn't. Or they'll threaten them and stuff. So the men kind of have to put up with some drama because the women will take advantage of that opportunity if it ever arises. I mean, I know in not in Texas, but other units where 
Females have literally walked in the door of the warden's office and spit semen out on her desk. Mm. So stuff, I mean, stuff happens like that. But like I said, if you're a man and you go to a female unit, you need to know if your weaknesses is if you're a sex addict or if you have boundary problems. If you have boundary problems, stuff like that, you probably shouldn't work at a female prison. Right? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be honest, right? Every man in his life has probably either heard a joke about being a prison guard in a woman's prison or, or told one or something, you know, as a little kid and stuff. So it's it really is. When you put it to me like that, there's no way I would work in that environment, right? That's what that's on there, no. And well, some many, choose not to. Some ab- absolutely say I won't do that. No, nah, yeah, I there's no way in hell I do, do that. that. But I thought a female prison for me to start out in was a good place for me to start out in to get my feet wet. To what see prison did they send you to first? Lane Murray. Lane Murray. That's the only prison I worked in in Texas. Okay, um, I've actually heard of Lane Murray and the women. Them. The women talk about it like it's pretty hardcore for the women right there. I guess that might be the the tough one that they have. Well, they do have um, they have all custody levels up to the max, where they have to be um, housed in you know single cells. Um, I did work there usually to fill in and stuff, but people put in for that, and they tend to put the same people in that area but if somebody's calls off sick or on vacation they'll plug one of us other ones in and i did work in there for you know on and off from time to time and um i didn't i didn't mind it i liked it it was all right but uh what i did i liked a lot of things about texas is they don't stick you like with just minimum custody inmates they move you around a lot so you're going to go from a level one inmate to a level five or a four and so I really was well-rounded. And when I got to Arizona, their yard was set up different. The, each yard was its own custody level. There, each building was its own custody level, but you had several different custody levels. And the higher custody level, they had a fence up in between those buildings from the, uh, from the lower custody to keep them separated. So... Right. So you, you like that? I thought maybe you wouldn't, people wouldn't like that. You did like moving around and doing different stuff in a prison. Well, I like it because you never get bored. And that's another thing. If you always, if you, you never know what to expect, you could have a boring night or you could have a crazy night. Um, Or you could just have in between where a couple little things go off or a medical problem or whatever. You just never know what's going to happen. And, and it's kind of um, entertaining in a way. You don't get bored with your job. That's for sure. So when, when you first when you first got to Lane Murray and you're actually situated, you know, not like your first day or whatever, but when you're situated and you're kind of getting used to your job, what would you say would be the main thing that surprised you about those women inmates? Um, the f- you know right away who the troublemakers are. It's usually the girls with the big mouths running around yapping and talking. And they're always the ones talking in the back of the run and stuff. Um, I just decided that I was going to kind of be by the book. I don't think I was a mean officer, but I was kind of by the book. So I followed the rules. There were times I would negotiate a ticket, um, but we didn't even have to tell the mates they were getting a ticket. In Arizona, they make you notify the inmate, which I think is stupid. Um, You know, you tell an inmate you're on report, you get punched in the face. Right. So Texas didn't make us do that, which I liked. Yeah, it'll come come later. They don't even they don't even know it's coming. Uh, They drop it on their ass. (laughs) Well, sometimes uh, sometimes they'll ask you or they'll say, hey, you know, I messed up and I'm sorry. If they had the. If they did something publicly in front of all the other inmates that made me write a ticket that was disrespectful, I would make them apologize in front of everybody because they did it in front of everybody. That's you fair. Know what I mean? That's fair. So that, look, here's my next question. They would do silly things like that. I would let them out of the ticket and not write it. But there is a lot of discrepancies. That, or um, It was our discretion on whether we wanted to write tickets or not. 
I've always I've always wondered this. So I'm gonna ask you questions. I've always wondered. So when you work, you were at Lane Murray four years, right? Four and a half years, something like that. How well do you feel you get to know these female prisoners as a female prison guard? Like, it, uh, I mean, I know of course you see them, but is there? In, I mean, I'm not su- suggesting anything inappropriate or anything like that, right? But how well, like, do you? Do you start recognizing almost all of them by face and name and, and knowing something about them? Or is, after four years, are they still just a crowd of people? Um, well, certain inmates made themselves known more than others. And usually the troublemakers are the ones that I knew more about. The other inmates that didn't cause problems, I didn't really communicate with them that much, you know? Right. Right. Do you know so, why I asked that? Because the listen, troublemakers uh, always kind of take up your time and take up your energy. And you start learning the games they play. Like you're walking down the run doing a security check and they pop up in front of you and ask you a question or whatever. And, you know, that's a game. They want to stall you out because somebody's doing something in the back they shouldn't be doing. Right, right. And I would just say, walk and talk, walk and talk. And I just keep walking. And I really learned to like, uh, like, I was super polite and everything before, but you can't really be super polite to inmates because they take you for, they take that for a weakness. They say, oh, she's real nice or whatever, especially in the men's prison. The men take it from a female. If you're nice to them, like you would be anyone else on the street. Sometimes they take it wrong and think you like them because they've been like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Oh, 20. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't rude or I wasn't mean. Some people said I was rude, but I wasn't trying to be rude. I was just direct. So listen, you didn't let me, you didn't let me say it. What I was going to say is, oh, Miss Donna, I wouldn't have liked you working my cell block. She got me, y'all, when she said buy the book. Man, listen. So here's the thing, though. When an officer says buy the book, we're okay with that as inmates as long as you're by the book every time you work. Don't please don't come in here letting us smoke a cigarette tonight and then be by the book tomorrow type stuff. You know what I mean? So if, if an officer is by the book, and obviously you was pretty sharp too with the walk and talk thing, because man, that would have got us too every time we would have sent somebody to go talk to you too while we're trying to put up the tattoo gun or something. You know what I mean? So you yeah, yeah. you would have busted us, but yeah, it's consistency. So the, we look for officers that are consistent. It don't matter what type of consistency, right? Just so you can kind of know what to do. And, hey, when Miss Donna works tonight, hey, she's working. Y'all chill out. Don't do nothing. You know what I mean? Respect her. Let her let her do her job. And tomorrow, maybe we'll get somebody else, hopefully. You know, what I, and that's kind of how we would always look at it, right? We Nobody would, uh, like, uh, it, it was the, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, it's the ones I that. Very, I was yeah. very consistent. I was, I can say that I was very consistent. Once I started to get my feet wet and I had decided how I wanted, what kind of an officer I wanted to be, I was by the book, but I wasn't mean or nasty to anybody. I was just kind of by the book, but I would, I wouldn't bend rules, but I would tell them negotiate tickets from time to time and maybe if it was an inmate that apologized or maybe i hadn't had a problem with that inmate before and they were just having a bad day sometimes i would let it slide and i would be open to that so i wasn't so hard-nosed but and they also in texas they called they called me the bloodhound because i couldn't worse y'all it's getting worse I could instinctively just walk down a run and I could feel there was something in there and I would just step in and get what I needed to get. I, I just would have an instinct about it in Arizona. They didn't like that. The administrators told me, stop that up, knock it off. Oh, like well, it. See, that's what I was going to get ready to say. Now, right? some, some prisons and some wardens don't want you doing that. Right. Cause they, I said this the other day in a video, I don't even remember which one, but uh, his hands popular. are dirty. That's why. Yeah, well, listen. So when a prison is a certain way, the it's a certain way because they want it to be that way, right? If they if they want her to be the bloodhound and go find stuff and be by the books, that's what she's gonna do. But had they not wanted her, or been okay with that, yeah, they would have let you know here, cut that out, right? You're messing stuff up. So we call that 
more like a convict unit, you know, where you they don't go looking for stuff. And that's what I did like about the feds is, man, they didn't go looking for anything. As long as we didn't do it out in the open, they were pretty much cool with that. But there were a lot of guys with life sentences and all kind of stuff. So they were just letting them live. And that was that was a lot better. And man, in the state, there so were a whole bunch of you were in federal prison. Yeah, I was in. I went to state jail, TDC, ID unit, and to the feds. I won the damn lotto. A dumb fool. I've been to all three of them. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm not too proud of that, right? But I did. Yeah. So the last place I was at in the feds. But anyway, this is about you. And make sure to listen. Her her link to her channel is in the description of this video, y'all. She does have a YouTube channel that she just recently started. It's over 500 subscribers right now. We hope we can get her over a thousand with this video. And her YouTube channel is Corrections Mama 27. So y'all make sure y'all check it out. She's well, this here's the plot twist. She was a correction officer in Texas and Arizona, and even had a son in prison that he does YouTube, AZ Ruxton. So shout out to the YouTube Streets podcast and all of them, man. He has his own channel also. So this is just a YouTube thing tonight. And here's here's what I wanted to ask you. So you you said it right. I I was like, whoa, she just straight up said it. But when you're talking about being a high ride, high rider officer, what you might have to do, right? So in in prison, working in prison, did you really see shit that you didn't like from the staff? I mean, from the from the people and stuff like that, as far as now, I'm not even worried about inmates. We know what happens, but how were they treating the, the guards? How were they treating y'all like the administration? Well, honestly, like on my channel lately, I talk a lot about some of the dirty stuff that goes on between officers and administrators and things like that. Um. I do have inmate stories and different things that have happened that I talk about and things that I've had happen to me. Um, I do talk about that stuff too. Um, but a lot of my stories are really about the bullshit that goes on behind the prisons on the, on the officer's side. Right. But I, you know, so I would think when you're telling me by the book and doing your job, I would think that the administration, you'd be the one that they love though. Like you'd probably be one of their favorite new, new hires, right? I did well in Texas. They liked me there in Texas, Arizona, uh, not so much because they're kind of, oh. they're really more, I think they are uh, more corrupt. And so it's so just they, the, it's the administration. Yeah. The administrators uh, kept telling me, Hey, calm, calm the fuck down. Calm down. You don't need to do all that. You're making your job harder than it needs to be. We don't need you to do all that. Right. That's and I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? If you're okay with drugs and you don't want me, you know what I mean? In Texas, um, I really didn't see that much drugs in the women's prison. I saw, I found some escape paraphernalia. What was that? What do you mean? This chick was making a dress out of her clothes and dyeing it and everything. Oh, wow. Really? And I was walking down the run and had that gut feeling and I just slipped in her house because we got to do we had to do five searches per officer every day in our building. Uh -huh. So you got to do five random searches. So I would and they have a clipboard with every bed number on it, kind of like a count sheet, but it doesn't have the inmates name that lives there. It just has the bed numbers and then you sign off that you search that house. So some inmates knew this and some inmates acted like this was a personal vendetta. It's not about you. Trust me. Well, I got 250 inmates in the dorm. I'm really not thinking about one or two or five different. You know what I mean? Hey, let me it's, ask you about the dress. So when you when you seen this dress and you found it, did you instantly right away go, oh, shit, this is some escape pair? Or did you go, what the hell? I probably would have seen that and like wonder what's going on for a minute. Yeah, I knew what it was because the everyone wore all the inmates wore white. And what she did was is she and the females have like gowns, but she didn't she didn't use the gown. She took the shirt and used the shirt and then was attached. She attached the bottom of the another shirt and then cut the arms off at the bottom and was putting some pleats in it or something. Oh, and wow. she had dyeing material something she was using. She was using something like I think maybe some kind of pigment. It might have been from colored pencils or something. I'm trying yeah, to remember. Yeah, use map colors to make them. Yeah, make ink and stuff. She was, 
crushing stuff up like that and then trying to make a dye and she was going to die tie, die the it was legit like it was how, you, really how, how do you think she was going to try to move next you think did they have like catch her with a plan or anything or that was it no she had um she had a plan and she had um information written down and how it was going to go down and everything oh shit she probably got 10 more years she went, just for that she went, she went to max after I'll that tell you, yeah i bet she did Got some more time too, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you but I didn't find, I really didn't find, I I found tobacco from now, now and then, but tobacco is a class three felony you bring it in at Texas. Right. So, yeah. I mean, officers couldn't have dip. They couldn't have cigarette. They couldn't have any type of tobacco, but they did give a smoke break. Um, some people that smoked would get twice, uh, twice a shift. Somebody would relieve them and they'd go smoke in the po parking lot. Uh -huh. And I did catch one chick, an officer, which I turned in. She was putting, uh, you know, a, a case of cigarettes under the trash can at the smoking table in the parking oh, lot. Shit. So the porter would go out there and clean up and then pick it up. And she had, they did an investigation and found out that she had hurt, that girl's kids were living with her. Oh, man. They were lovers or what? She was. I don't know how she knew her or whatever, but I think they, from what I understood, um, they later found out in the investigation that, because the investigator basically kind of told me, because yeah. I know I turned her in and says, look, I don't know, I don't know what this girl's doing or whatever. I hated that girl anyway. I knew she was dirty. I didn't like her because she would come in on my um, shift to give me a lunch break. And um, I would come back and it was like a damn party going on. Whoa. And I had everything just normal. Everybody just kind of chill doing their thing. I come back and they're dancing on the tables. They're running around screaming and yelling. And it's just like, what the, what the duck happened? Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, so listen, hold on, hold on. This, yeah. uh, this, this Texas prison stories, and we like to tell them this is not the life you want, right? So they're messing with you in the comments. They're not being real, real disrespectful or anything. They're just saying, boy, she was a, she was the real, the real deal. Comment if you're watching this video, realize that she says she's by the book, and she's not kidding, right? And that we're fine with that too. Like we said, a uh, whole bunch of officers of that. So people, Miss Donna, people need to see this. And I told you the first time we talked that this channel is all about showing people this is not the life they want right so imagine right. you ladies imagine you ladies i don't care how how bad you think you are in life what you've done uh might have killed people and all this now you go into a texas prison and miss donna's right here by the book not you ain't you ain't getting away with nothing you know what i mean and there's a hundred of them ones just like her i want people to think about that because what you're saying and and, and i'm fixing to parlay this into something real important right i'm sorry i'm rambling but you have people that you're going to answer to in there that you've never met a day in your life. It's going to be a woman like this, a man that you've never met, and they're going to be officially in charge of you. And that's that's crazy for a free world person to understand. And before you got your job, that was probably mind blowing. I'm fixing to be in charge of these crazy crooks. You know what I mean? And now it's happening. So it's it's just a different world. Right. But I asked you something. Well, on the flip side of that, of being a, a by the book officer, nobody get, nobody's gotten killed on my ship. Right. Nobody's See. gotten killed on my watch. Well, nobody no. So listen, let me let, me let me let me let me let me ask that, Miss Donna. So I listen, did my checks and stuff. So so what I'm saying, and this is the deal, okay? If you're a loved one, or if you're in prison and you don't like it, and you're probably scared, and you might be getting taking advantage of getting robbed and stuff you're gonna pray miss donna comes work to sale block right you're gonna hope she does now if you're in there with the with the bs and the activities and all that you're not gonna want her to work so there's so everybody ain't upset when she's showing up like she said nobody got killed on her shift they weren't doing crazy stuff and so that that is the actual design of the prison system is to have officers by the book like that's why Texas prisons are so messed up because how you said in Arizona, right? How they told you just calm down and chill out. That's how Beto was. That's how Ferguson is. That's how a whole lot of prisons in Texas are for the men's side where they don't go looking and you do, you are not safe is what I'm saying. Right. So officers mm -hmm. like you 
do keep people safer. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. An officer like her that's by the book, y'all, don't hate on her because check this out. She is the officer that will make sure that you get fed like you're supposed to get fed and the officer that doesn't let you miss commissary. You know what I mean? Like we need and I'll make sure you get if you need medical, you're going to get medical. Right. Right. And so many other officers you're gonna won't. Be OK, because I'm going to make sure you get what you got coming. Now, I'm not giving you anything extra, but you'll get what you got coming to you. I'm not going to fuck with your mail. I'm not going to fuck with right. your property. Right. I'm not going to do anything dishonest. Those officers that aren't doing their jobs, they're generally not honest people either. Right? All right. All right. So I was straight all the way around. Do you know what right. I mean? So, so, so let me ask you this, because this is what I was trying to get to, right? Oh, uh, when, when, because this is t TPS, we show them it's not the life you want. I had no idea. And you told me about the whole squad, the women in whole squads. You just mentioned being a high rider and all that type of stuff. Can you tell me what an average day for the woman working in Texas prisons on that whole squad was like? They would turn out real early in the morning. They turn out on graveyard shift. Like they go get up at four in the morning, go to chow, go back to the house and make sure they're ready. And then they'd head out and, um, we stripped them in and we stripped them out and they stripped. We were supposed to strip everybody, anyone coming in and out of your building. If they're a worker, you stripped them in and out. And, um, even if there was a porter or whatever, so they were pretty strict about that, but, um, <clears throat> the females would go out and then they would come back in in the afternoon at about three o'clock. Were they really work them out there? Were they working for real like the men? Yeah, do? they were stinky and sweaty and hot and nasty. Yep, they worked Blister, them real hard. Blisters on their really hand hot. when they show up, everything. Yeah, they had um, they had hand tools that they used to work the crops. So there were times when they were harvesting. There were times when they were planting and seeding, and they were they did it all by hand. And that's a lot. That's a lot of work. But uh, they also anyone that came into the prison, that's their first job. That's where they started. Absolutely. Can I and ask you? A, can that, I ask you? A real, break them in, you know. Listen, listen. Here's here's a BS question I have for you. But this is something that men prisoners always wonder, right? So if they take us to to the whole squad, field squad, or whatever, and we have to pee, that we have to walk off to the edge and pee on our knees, right? So we can't break off running while we're on the edge and do the women do, surely the women don't have do they bring a toilet out there for the women is there yeah, like a little pot, potty going porter, on the wagon what do they have they have porta potties for them they bring them out there yeah but the officers probably would search the port porta potty at the beginning of their shift and sometime in the middle and then again later so things wouldn't be dropped off and stuff i don't know what their procedure was when the inmates had to go to the bathroom but I would imagine they'd pat them down when they were done, at least. You know, I actually liked Texas. It was much more organized, and I feel like there was less corruption. The inmates, the inmates didn't just come up and talk to you for BS reasons. Because anytime they just come up and talk to you and try to be buddy buddy with you, I was always suspicious. You know. So I was the I was the inmate that never you ever want to talk to a guard. They would get beat up if they talked to officers. Um, and like for chow and stuff, they were they had to walk in a straight line right behind each other to go to chow and to come back. And there was no talking. And if you come up to an officer, you have to have your hands behind your back. I went to Arizona and I, I inmates were just coming up doing this. And I'm like, hey, put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. And they get all, what, what are we going to do that for? I would freak out because they were swinging their hands around talking. And I thought I was going to get punched out. Right. You know? do, do women prisoners, do they have uh, they prison like gangs that. and gangs and stuff like that? Um, I wasn't aware of a lot of gang activity. It's more family unit pseudo relationships that the females. Oh, that's real. Have. Like we see on TV with the mama and the kids and all that's for real. They, they were talking like, what do you talk? What do you, what do you search in my mama's house for? Or that's my sister or that's my cousin. That's my nephew. Or that's my little girl. That's my little boy. I mean, even though they, they had like 
some of the LGBTQ, whatever, um, they had some inmates that more masculine looking. Uh, inmates used to call them dykes. So and listen, listen, mom, I've seen a- uh, They would adopt those a, as the male figures in the families. Right, I've seen a, a, it was like a scare straight type program one time on, on TV. And it was these masculine inmate women that had tattoos on their face. They had muscles. They were wearing wife beaters. And I'm thinking, Dan, I think I might be scared of them if I met them. You know what I mean? Like, they were real tough. Did you see some, like, real tough women in there where you're like, oh, shit. Well, yeah, some of them. But I think some of that is a front. They're just taking on the masculine role to be in the family, the pseudo family. Because then maybe they are already kind of masculine or maybe they're already big or maybe they just like that role or maybe it's a position of control and power for them too. I mean, they all have their own agenda or their own reason for doing that. Some were legitimate, legitimately, uh, you know, gay and wanted to be a man, but they're not. So they would just play the role, you know. So I'm trying I to ignored a lot of that stuff. I didn't keep track of all the drama like that because these women right. were drama. There was always a f arguments and fights and cat fights and things going on all the time about dumb stuff that really didn't matter, but it mattered to them at the time. And they would get all emotional. And when women fight, it's a different kind of fight than a men. It's a different kind of fight because they don't give up when they know they're done, when they know it's over. When you got five staff show up, the men usually put their hands behind their back and give up, right? The women don't. They'll like take you all on because they're fighting from an emotional standpoint. They're right. coming from an emotional place and they have a hard time shutting that down. And so they just, they just want to fight everybody. And when you fight with an emotional standpoint, sometimes that makes you stronger because you got more adrenaline in your body, right? right? Right. So let me ask you something. So I did a poll. I mentioned this the other day. 70% of my viewers have never been in prison themselves. They watch because they're curious. So in Texas, if if you're working, as you said, you're locked in with them that you can't run out, right? Let them know what do they give you as a prison guard, correctional officer. I apologize. What do they give you to protect yourself in there like if they if these women want to turn on you today while you're on your shift what do you have in here in texas nothing we had handcuffs if you worked in um the max unit you know you could they would give you a baton but that was just for show you really weren't supposed to use it if you used it you better be able to prove that your life was on the line because you're going to be out of a job and right. you could even get charged you know, for, um, right. It's so one of the commenters not, said the only thing they give you is a radio and that's a radio, it. a radio and handcuffs in Texas. Now, Arizona, they had, pe um, I could carry pepper spray and handcuffs and now you can also carry a taser. Oh, oh, you know, so they're going to, they're going to allow certain ranking officers in Texas to have a taser too. Now it's going to be like, a for special occasions, right? For people they really don't like, I, I guess. You, you really piss them off, you're going to get the taser now. But they're, so I think maybe the lieutenants or somebody are going to have them. So that I didn't I didn't even know other states yeah, had but it. Yeah, if something goes down, you got to wait for them to show up. It's going to be over by then, right? Right. Do the so, women's prison, do y'all have like a oh, sort team, like, you know, SWAT team, special operations or anything like that, where they got to do cell, cell yeah. extractions, a thing on a women's prison? Uh, cell extractions on both men and male. I've worked the women's, the men's, and I've worked juvenile. Juveniles that were um, charged as adults. That's actually where I ended up retiring from was that unit. But um, so I've worked all the whole spectrum. Um, what was the question again? About cell extractions. Just do the women make y'all oh, do yeah. them or not? Well, we called different... Arizona called it something different and Texas called it, we called it tactical support. And um, so we'd suit up with five people. Um, I only remember suiting up once in Texas. And then I've suited up a few times in Arizona.
So if it's a uh, woman in the cell, that. it's it is women that suit up and go get them. Or well, it depends too. on what the warden wants. Like, for example, when I worked at the um, in when I worked in Arizona, we had this girl. She was not a big girl, but she was. I think she had some kind of mental illness, but she was like nutso. She would fight to the death. She was very, very, very violent, and she would hurt people. So, but the um, her name her name was Danish. I remember the name because it then it was unusual. It was like it was like she was named after a pastry, but she was a monster. <laughs> and, wasn't very sweet, huh? Right, she wasn't sweet at all. So whenever she would have her meltdowns, we would go in, and we had men on our team. And then one day the warden changed the rules, and she said, "We're not doing that anymore. These are women. We're not putting men." Cause we'd always put the guy with the shield in the front to knock him on the ground. Well, she said, we're not doing that. These are women. I don't want somebody getting hurt. It's not a fair fight. What are you talking about? It's not a fair fight. It isn't a fair fight in the first place. It ain't supposed to be. It's five against one. All right. Duh, right? Like, what are you thinking? And now you want the women to get the women officers to get hurt. We can't have men on our team. She's like, so no, can I, I ask you something you since you said that and you brought this up with me? I know you might didn't see this. Let me tell you what we did. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. We, we, when she said that, we decided each shift figured out who the biggest, toughest, strongest woman was. And we put her in front and we had this chick named Lewis. And um, she was, I love the lady. She was super cool. I, we were friends, but she was a big, mean black bitch. And we always put her in front because she would knock him to the floor every time. <laughs> she okay. was like a linebacker. So I was getting ready to say if it's football, she will be the linebacker. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I listen, no, this is a this is a serious question. I I had no intention of asking you, but this is kind of important. Recently in Texas, there was a young CEO uh named Jovian Motley, right? Made a lot of news. He was they said he was a newer officer and he really wasn't in his job description to be running in sales and doing the instructions and all this, but he volunteered to go on the team this day. Right. And he, the first word was that he, he, he passed in the line of duty. It took a while for information to trickle out. Right. According to the autopsy, he was, he was uh, what do you call it? Asphyxiated. It was a lack of oxygen and they're not really, telling much to the family other than the cell was dark and they don't know what happened can you imagine as somebody that had or an officer this was an officer he was a young officer that hadn't been there okay. too long and uh so he was so the i think he was I'm, I'm sorry if i get this wrong right i think he was fourth or fifth man in so he would he didn't have the shield he wasn't supposed to grab an arm he was one of the feet okay in some right. type of way he ended up obviously under the dog pile long enough to to pass away and he's a small guy the pictures i've seen he, he didn't look big at all yeah he didn't but this is my question for you can you imagine a scenario in your experience where somebody in your team is down long enough on the ground to where he could actually pass away i mean it's like that's a real thing that can really happen because if me and four of my friends are jumping you inside of a prison cell and you got one of my friends on the ground and he's dying or somebody else is on top of him, man, I'm going to, I'm going to lay off the guy I'm fighting and save my buddy. You know what I mean? So we're, the public is having an immense and his mom too. Right. So you know, I'll say this one, one last thing. There's a, a page on Facebook that is an ex CEO runs it to kind of has an ax to grind. And he asked a question because most of his followers are see current CEOs, how they felt about that situation. And, the lack of compassion from the active COs and the ex COs towards this young man that passed away. Nobody would accept that perhaps that cell extraction was done wrong. Perhaps they should have used a spotlight from the picket to light the cell up since he knocked his light out. Uh, all the way to reactions from people like me that, hey, maybe that cell extraction wasn't even necessary, right? Because what he did, the inmate stuck his arm through the food slot and he wouldn't take it out. Then a few minutes later, an officer is dead. My opinion was hey, you could have turned his water off, turned his power off and just went on about your business, or you could have sprayed him with, with mace or something. 
but we know that a lot of times in Texas, I can't say Arizona, that cell extractions well, that are falls because on the ship commander you piss people off. You know, the ship commander makes those decisions, and that would fall on the ship commander, or maybe even above, because sometimes the ship commander is required to call a higher ranking officer like a captain or the warden even if it's on off you know late at night and they're not there or whatever they should have somebody on call but um those decisions are generally made and passed on through the shift commander and i've known shift commanders that have just waited it out and just are very very patient and i know people that have jumped a gun and got in trouble for it. But it's a dirty, it's, it's a dirty, dangerous thing. Cause I've had inmates that we've had to go in on and they would soap up the floor. Yeah. So we fall all over the place. You know what I mean? And sure. so uh, there's a lot of, uh, some of them would put baby oil on the floor. Baby oil. Yeah. They had. So the, there was a lot of dirty tricks. Some of them would put shit on the floor or piss just to yes. be disgusting. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's a dangerous job. And every time you do a cell extraction or something like that, you, they always learn something from it. So what they need to do is evaluate it and decide what they need to learn. There should have been a camera there. I know Texas, even back then in the late nineties, they were real big on the cameras. Oh yeah. So that I used yeah, to run camera know. sometimes back when it was a big camera you had to sit on your shoulder, uh -huh. that big old Sony. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know somebody, listen, I know somebody that took that camera when the guards sat it down and they took it and destroyed it after they had already filmed all the evidence with it. That was a big that was a big situation. I need to tell that story one time. But so they come in there shaking everybody down, roughing everybody up because they set the camera down and the inmate grabbed it. But that's that's the dirty game. So it is dirty games. Listen to what she's telling you. For sure, I was going to say a lot of them baby oil to sell down. They, uh, they'll they Vaseline themselves up, you know, feces. It's, you're dealing with mental illness, anybody that makes the squad come in. But my real question is to you, what, what scenario can you see where it takes so long and nobody notices this man passing away? Is it that hectic in there? Is it that chaotic in there? Because I know it is, but is it that... Like, are, are these COs panicking too? They, they, didn't don't notice, notice this? they didn't notice he was dead. You, they would have had to notice once they all got the inmate under control and all started getting up, and Johnny didn't get up, right? Like, is it possible that it takes so long with these cell extractions that he could be down and they not notice? Like, are they quick? Do you do, you do them in I'm two seconds? They didn't, if it was something like that, uh, sometimes they'll send canine in first. That way, oh, officers wow. don't get hurt. But Sometimes they don't do that because there's also lawsuits. Everyone wants to sue about everything. So or maybe canine wasn't available. I know we got canine and stuff, but I have rarely. I think I've only in 27 years only seen them use canine twice. I don't think I've ever even heard of it. Was it legal? Even known that Something they like used the canine or even was aware that an incident happened, whether it's on my shift or not, and they used canine. I've only known for them to do that twice. Usually the canine. I don't, it's a waste of money. What are they doing? They got these dogs trained and these officers trained to extract inmates with the dog, but they never use it. Right, I think it's right. just an intimidation thing, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but mostly what they use the dogs for is cell phone sniffing and drugs. Right. And they so, use it on staff, too. We get sniffed by the dogs, too. Uh -huh. They've got it now to where uh, Texas... Texas CO can't even bring in a bottle of water anymore. Can't bring in uh, any type of liquid, nothing from food to hygiene products, no roll-on deodorant, nothing. They're searching them. They're bringing, I, they were having to bring in clear purses and clear backpacks and stuff. I don't even know if they can bring them at all anymore. That's so. what we did in Arizona. We could, in Texas, I was able to bring Tupperware food or whatever, but, you know, they'd have to look at it and scan it and whatever. So let me ask you this next question. Right. You're going into the prison and they're trying to tell you, well, you don't need to bring in food or water because we got food and water right here. You you eat and drink what the inmates eat. No, right, thank you. Right, right, no, right. I'm not. Because the inmates will spit and shit in your food. The females will put menses in your food or in the ice box. You know, the ice maker. They'll, uh -huh. put, they'll put their dirty pads and tampons in there. 
I wouldn't want to eat none of that if I was them. I, I never, I've, I'm my whole career, <laughs> I've only eaten in the chow, eaten uh, in food in the ODR. Arizona doesn't have an ODR. You just, you just tell the officer, bring you a tray. Gross. The uh, only time I seen this, I was in the feds. We had a warden, believe it or not, that would come into the chow hall all the time and get the inmates to make him a tray. And that's what he would eat. Like, I, I don't know if, I guess he was trying to make some type of statement, right? Because our prison had probably the worst food in the entire federal system. It was exactly like Texas state prison food. It wasn't like people think, but here's the question. Cause I got to go pretty soon. I, I just wanted to get you on here so everybody could see you. Cause I like your channel and it's such a great different perspective. Right. But here's a question that's going to be important to a lot of people. There's a lot of loved ones outside the gates that they've never been to prison. They don't know what it's like or anything like that. Right. And, when their loved one is inside, can you explain to them how much exactly that person becomes state property? Like they're really, are they still there? I know. So, so you being that you've had a son in jail before, right? Shout out to AZ Russian. How, how did it feel based on your experience at work, knowing that you might can't do nothing for your son right now? You know what I mean? And he's kind of at these they when you when I when I have to take an inmate to and escort them to a hospital for injury or whatever, they can't even sign for their own care. They cannot consent to their own health care because they're they're a ward of the state. And I would have nurses hand the inmate sign this, and I'd be like, uh, "No, you need to hand that to me." She goes, "But he need." I said, "No, he can't consent." I'm the one that has to sign that. And sometimes they sign it and it's just like, whatever. But technically, legally, they can't consent. They can't consent to sex. They can't consent to, um, that's where Priya comes in. They can't consent to medical care. You know, they do lose a lot of the freedoms. They have no privacy. You lose your right to privacy when you go to prison. Obviously, you're going to get strip searched and pat searched and your stuff searched, your cell searched and stuff like that. There is no privacy in prison. So I know some inmates would demand privacy from me. I laugh at them. You don't you don't have a right to privacy. What are you talking about? What kind of fantasy world are you in? <laughs> so uh, but they do have human rights. They do have some rights. You know what I mean? But. You know, they could lose their rights to see their family. They could lose their rights to visit they, and if they have disciplinary and stuff like that. So, you know, I mean, think about it. They can't even consent to their own medical care. All right. How did it feel? How did it feel different now you're, you're a loved one with somebody in the system? I mean, now your mom, right, you, for your first. So this is where that comes in, right? First, it's correction officer, Miss Donna. Now it's corrections, mama. Are you knowing how things can go? Are you and I like are you are you picturing the worst things possible that can happen? Are you going, man? Uh, I hope you know how does that feel? Like just you knowing the system. Me. I think it was worse for me when uh John went to prison because I knew I knew what he was in for. I've seen him made to die, I've seen him get beat down and then come and then end up in uh uh, medical as a seven-year-old. I've seen them get their faces and the head stomped in. I've seen footprints on their faces and stuff. I've seen inmates get killed and die. I've seen them get stabbed for over dumb stuff. In the At the end of the day, it's not worth your life, you know? And I didn't, um, it was really hard. But I told my kids when they were younger, when I started this job, as they got older, don't go to prison because I'm not going to be visiting you. I'm not putting money on your books. I'm not writing you letters. I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know what I do for a living. And if you're going to be stupid enough to go to prison, you're going to do the time by yourself. I'm not going to be there for you, just so you know. And that's really the way it kind of was with my son. I didn't write him. I didn't visit him. I says, you know, you're not going to make me stand in the visitor's line. Maybe that was just like a selfish, prideish thing. But it was also, to me, it was principle. 
No, it's my mom told us the same that. thing, Miss Donna. Trust me. My mom, so my mom told us the same thing and stuck by it, but she came and seen me a few times. I ain't gonna lie. Like it it just comes to the point, I think, where she knew that she she wanted tough love, right? Because she didn't understand the damn thing we were doing. My mom is not a criminal, she's not a drug addict, recovering alcoholic, none of that. My mom retired a job 33 years working you know she's raised my brother's kids like so she's lived a real square life i guess you would say to to somebody in the street so she didn't understand why we did anything we did right and we couldn't explain it so no i get that right and but is that hard for a mom to do though like i mean so i mean really hard it was really hard i used to think about him all the time there was a time a period of time when he he was um at one of the prisons I worked at, oh. but he wasn't at the unit that any of the units I worked at. I don't think he was there for that long. He ended up uh, going to Florence, I think. But I had a I had a sister in prison. I had a brother in prison too. My brother spent most of his adult life from the time he was nineteen to fifty five in prison. I'll be he just got he went in for a charge and ended up killing an inmate in his cell because it was, you know, his life or their life. And he he didn't get murder for it. He got manslaughter because that particular inmate had a history of killing other inmates. So, you know, and then he ended up doing a lot of time for that. But as you know, you can go into prison for something stupid like a DUI and end up in a wreck where you're spending another 20 years. It happens that way sometimes. This and is not the life you want. Miss Donna, listen, so I'm I'm going to get up out of here, but I want to give you the floor, right? And I don't, whatever you, so obviously you did it for 27 years. I want you to this, this here, talk to the people in Texas that are watching that might be a CEO that might, can you just tell them a little bit about the good, a little bit of the bad that you learned. It don't have to be pertaining to Texas, Arizona. Just as the job, like, can do, first, do you recommend somebody in 2024 go be a prison op, prison officer and tell them what to expect and tell, shout out your YouTube channel and all that stuff again? And I'm going to close it. All right. Uh, my YouTube channel is um, Corrections Mama 27. And um, I think if for the right person, the job is a good job if you have self-awareness enough to know what your weaknesses are and if you know what you want to do but also the job is uh it's a hard it's hard it's a very hard job emotionally and physically it takes a physical toll on you sometimes you got to climb stairs all the time and uh i guess you just have to see if it's worth it i mean i kind of embraced the things i liked about it you know it's not a boring job, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, they'll hire you without a college education. I didn't have a college education, so it was a good job for me, and I got a pension out of it. It's really hard to stick it out that long, though, because it's a very stressful job. And, um, you know, I'm just sick of the hoe bags that work there, <laughs> you know, that are with inmates, with officers. They usually go through all the officers, and then they hit the inmates. And then they get fired. Um, but they cause a lot of drama. And, uh, you know, and if you have an officer and you're an inmate and you've had an officer that was kind of you call strict, you're going to probably think she's a bitch or whatever, or he or whatever. Really, the ones that are doing their job are the ones you want there because they're the ones that's going to save your life. Or they're the ones you're going to – nothing's – stuff don't go down. A lot of stuff – like really bad stuff didn't always go down on my shift and inmates would tell me that they would, they would schedule it a different day because they knew I was going to do my walks. You know, they knew I was doing my checks. So they would just call it a night and go to bed. <laughs> and that made it good for me too. Cause then it was less stress for me. Right. But there's still crazy things that happen and crazy things that go on. And, uh, if you're not a strong person and you make it through it, you, you be strong by the end. For sure. Yeah, that's some both people don't have the people tolerance for it. They just quit. They just can't, you know what I mean? And they don't pay enough. They don't really don't pay enough for what you're doing, putting your life on on the line, you know. 
So I don't know. It's just, I don't, I don't know that I would recommend it or not recommend it because they don't even offer the pensions anymore in Arizona. Um, if you were going to do it, probably be federal, probably be the best way to go. If you retire federal, it's 25 years, but you're going to get a good pension. And I think they get medical for life. Yeah. One thing Texas has is they have the, now the retirement after 10 years where you don't get as big a financial pension, but they get the medical for life stuff. So, you know, if a, I would say like this, that'd be worth it. That'd be worth it. Yeah, no, hell yeah. So I regret in life at being this age, not going into the military. Cause I didn't realize that that would have gotten me out of a lot of stuff. I'd be in a much better place and I would have medical for life now. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. So Miss Donna, you thank in trouble while you were in the military, if you get in trouble, you go to the brig. Hey, well, I would have had one more system. I could have told stories about then. How about that? Cause I got three, I'd be the military prison guy too. Miss Donna, thank you so much for coming, man. You're a great speaker. I really enjoyed this. If you ever want to do it again or anything like that, I'm always down here. If you need any help yeah. on YouTube or whatever, man, I really appreciate it. You were so kind to come bless us and it's just been great. Everybody listen to what I'm saying, y'all. Uh, her channel is in the description. If you click the video description, it's literally right there. Corrections Mama 27. Her son is AZ Ruction. He has a YouTube channel. Uh, shout out to the YouTube Streets Podcast. Okay. You spell that with the letter U, which always gets me to is U T U B E, YouTube Streets Podcast. They're, they're a young podcast that talks about the prison genre, uh, things that are happening on YouTube, stuff like that. It's pretty cool. I enjoy it. I've done some videos with them. I actually met her doing a video with those guys on that channel because her son is part of it. Uh, Krupp yeah, right there. That. Yeah, look, shout out Krupp. He's right there. I saw, I seen a bunch of them from the YouTube streets uh, here, and I'm sorry. I didn't mean to diss anybody. Hi, I'm Dog, man. Shout out to everybody. Much love. Thank you so much for watching. Y'all hit that thumbs up and subscribe to Corrections Mama 27. And I'll catch y'all later. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.